to film in Minnesota. To <laughs> I'm Alan Tracy. <laughs> Words. <laughs> uh, I'm Rahana Power. <laughs> and today we have Brent Duncan with us. What? Hello, hello. Another Welcome, person? Brent. Yeah, I know, right? Socially it's like the distanced. Podcast was designed to have people on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we've proven that wrong for the last year. So, <laughs> um, yeah, we like to think outside of that box. <laughs> <laughs> have less people on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went full minimalist on this one. Oh, yeah. um, so, Brent, <clears throat> you're you're. What, what do you do in film? Tell us a little bit first off. Who are you? Um, I do basically everything except for uh, 3D character animation and sound work uh, and, and like composing I don't do. Um, but I will do writing, producing, directing, and cinematography. Primarily, I do uh, directing and cinematography. I do a fair amount of editing and color grading as well, but uh, directing and and cinematography are my two main areas of expertise, I would say. Awesome. I think Rohana had a question for you. I do. I wasn't sure if you had a follow-up on that, so I wanted to give you a second before I jumped in. Oh, okay. I tend to jump on on things really quickly and go for it. Go for it. Okay, <laughs> um, Brent. Before we dive into all of the details of you and what you do and how and why and where and all the things, um, tell us about a special, maybe secret talent that you have that others may or may not already know about you. Um. Well, I mean, I have a couple visual ones, but those aren't going to help because this is audio. <laughs> uh, like I can roll my tongue and stuff like that. Um, mm. I can bend my thumbs uh, all the way back and touch my arm with them. Ooh, um, ah. But um, I guess, you know, probably one of my best secret talents is that I have an extraordinarily high tolerance for pain to the point where when I get a tattoo... I have been known to fall asleep. So Really? Yes. I find it that, immensely relaxing. Hmm. That is fascinating. I'm jealous of that actually. <laughs> I, I want more, but I keep thinking about how painful it was and I'm like, I don't know if I could do that again. That's incredible. <laughs> well the, I mean the healing process sucks. Well yeah. But you know, getting the tattoo it, it <laughs> does not bother me at all. For sure. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, that's pretty cool. I'm sure a lot of people would love to uh, to have a high pain tolerance like that. So, nice. <laughs> yes. Brent, talk about pain. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just change the whole yeah. layout of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. The what about Bob treatment, you know? Just... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> um, let's see. Well... Today, we, we definitely are going to touch on the camera side first for you. Uh, we're we're going to get nerdy here, get really deep into some technical aspects that I know part of our audience likes, and then um, we'll see where that goes. Um, <laughs> right on. Uh, when it comes to cameras, do you have any ideal camera or specifications about like technical technical? Sp- Specs that you like or prefer, perhaps? Um, you know, <clears throat> I like a camera that is uh, full frame, ideally. I really like that look. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like cameras that don't require an obscene amount of light to get a good image. Um, I always light my images, don't get me wrong. Uh, very, very rarely will you see me shoot with just natural lighting. That's just not something that I really tend to do. But um, I do like a sensor on a camera that just doesn't require it to be lit like film. Right. But uh, as far as, you know, like HD, 4K, 8K, 12K, all that... um, 
I tend to prefer uh, around 6K just because I like to have a little bit of room to play uh, with the image in post if I need to. Uh, but I, I pretty much these days output everything at 4K. Um, I think unless you're doing an IMAX release, 8K or 12K is just overkill. You just don't need it. Um, and I know some people have talked about future proofing, but um, judging by the way the 8K TVs are selling, I don't think 8K is going to be happening anytime soon, uh, at least not the way Samsung was hoping. Um, hmm. It's just one of those things that when you put an 8K TV and, uh, say, a 4K OLED TV next to each other, most people think that the 4K OLED is the 8K TV because it looks better. Um, hmm. And that just has to do with, you know, the way the image is presented versus, you know, the actual number of pixels. That At, at a certain point, our eyes can only resolve so many pixels anyway in a living room setting. So, you know, for most people, anything beyond 4K is just, it doesn't matter at home, you know. In the theater, it can matter. Especially, you know, if you're talking, like I said, IMAX, then you definitely want 8K or 12K for sure. But... Hmm. Beyond that, you know, there's just no point. Right. So 6K is kind of where you land for today, yeah, I six, suppose. Yeah, 6K is my sweet spot right now. Mm-hmm. It also, you know, it, it uses up a fair amount of storage, but it's a lot less than 8K, and it's it's an insane amount less than 12K. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, when we hear about like black magic cinema cameras that are twelve K today, it's like, hmm. <laughs> well, I'm really yep. after the like hundred frame per second four K for instance, or right. like six K, eight K, whatever. Yep. But um talk about like some a camera like uh that twelve K that Black Magic released. Um what does it do to the sensor, like, um, when you maybe use a lower resolution? Well, I'm I'm not a fan of that. I tend to shoot at the sensor's native resolution mm-hmm. um, because then you're, you're getting rid of some other possible issues that can come up uh, with pixelation and oversampling and subsampling and everything else. Um, so I tend to always shoot at the camera's native resolution. Uh, mm. The only time I will go to a lower resolution is if the camera requires it for some sort of high frame rate. So if I'm shooting you know, 120 frames per second, um, and the only way I can do that is to go from a 6K down to a 4K, okay, I'll do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, I just don't do it because that's not the way that sensor was actually designed to be used and so in doing it you're, the, the algorithms in the camera the software can do it but your image is going to suffer it's not going to look as good as it would if you shot it at the native sensor resolution it's the same, same exact thing that I do with ISO if, if the camera's got a native ISO I will mm-hmm. always shoot at the native ISO because I can always add light I can always take light away I can change my aperture to you know, make more or less light hitting that sensor, but denoising in post is the bane of my existence. <laughs> I yes, I absolutely hate it. So yeah. if the manufacturer says, "Hey, we've got you know native ISO of 850," that's what I'm shooting at. If they say it's a dual native ISO and you've got 800 and 3200, fantastic. I will use both of those, but I will never go in between, and I'll never go higher or lower. Because it's just, I just hate noise. I hate it so <laughs> bad. I love grain, but I hate noise. Yeah, talk about the difference there, grain and noise. Let's. So grain is is the inherent structure of actual film. It's it's silver crystals is what you're seeing, hmm. and uh, it's it's a very beautiful thing. Versus noise is the camera itself in the software trying to enhance or brighten the image or darken it um, and it's creating color fragments in the pixels and it just looks awful 
Um, it's it's very very different because grain can be all sorts of colors. Grain can be it can be black, it can be white, it can be you know silver, it can be green, it can be orange, whatever. Um, but noise is always you know your RGB. It's red, green, and blue, and it's you know you can have uh, luminous noise in in black and white, um, but for the most part, it's RGB and it looks just like dog shit. <laughs> yeah, you can look at like clean images, but even with video today, like it's um, what's your experience there with like video versus obviously not shooting in film these days as much, um, if at all. Um, I, I actually you... picked up a couple of old Russian uh, Super 16 cameras recently and uh, was playing with them and it's it's been an absolute blast i have some super eights as well that i've used um it's the difficult part is that there's only like three labs in the entire united states that will process the stuff so you have to send it out and then you have to wait weeks to get it back it sucks and then you have to you know you either have to have a way to digitize it at home or you have to pay them to digitize it so Mm. it gets pricey real quick right yeah, I think, uh, like, when it comes to, like, video, though, is there much grain in that, or is it just all noise? Video doesn't have grain inherently, yeah. no. It, it, it can't, because it's not a physical medium. It's digital. Um, <clears throat> so you can add grain. You know, you can you can buy scans of actual film grain and then add that to your uh, work, whatever it is, a short film feature, whatever, um, which I do all the time. I, I don't think I have... Oh, I don't think I've shot anything except for docs that I have not added some amount of grain to because it makes it feel organic. It makes it feel like a film versus something that someone shot on a handy cam or with their camcorder or, or just making it look so digital. You know, yeah. Well, like when it comes to the noise that we talked about, one last question there: What's do you have a denoiser? Do you have a favorite formula for that, so to speak, or filter? Um, or I the, the Black Magic Studio denoiser is of everything I've used. It's hands down the best. It takes forever, but it yes. is amazing. Um, the results you get are just beyond anything else that I've used. Um, but yeah, it just, you know, especially if you're working with 4K or 6K footage or higher, uh, mm-hmm. you, you're talking about, you know, if, if you're doing a feature film and you have to denoise that entire film, you can just let everybody know that it'll be six months of just rendering out those clips. <laughs> Even on the fastest computer, it doesn't matter. Denoising is terribly slow. Right. Especially if you use yeah. a large sample kind of. Yes, yes, and I I tend to stick in the in the middle there in the you know because because mm. it, it lets you choose like one to five or whatever um, for some of them and I tend to stick to three and then on the the scales that you can slide from zero to one hundred I tend to go in the fifty to fifty five range. Oh wow! Um, because I I tend to find that anything beyond that the image starts to look too soft. You know, you're you're starting to lose definition then. Uh, uh, but yeah. in that middle range, you're getting enough samples on on you know movement, and um, you're also getting enough noise taken out that it looks a lot cleaner. Um, but you're not taking out so much that you're losing, you know, resolution. You're you're not you're not losing that sharpness that you put in there or that you want in there. Right, yeah, that's that's always tough. I know I'm working on a short, and that's, uh, yeah, I can see the noise, but, like, I've noticed in a lot of um, even commercial or video, like, films, I, I'm seeing either, I can't tell if it's noise or grain that they've added. Mm-hmm. Um, I would assume it's grain that they've added, but... Yep. Um, 
kind of looks like noise. <laughs> the you know the biggest I mean. way to tell is if it's if it's grain, you're going to see it all over the image. You're going to see it in highlights and low lights. If it's noise, oh. it's going to be primarily in the shadows. That's right. where you're going to see the noise. Ah, uh, because okay. sensors, they're not going to produce any noise in the highlights because it, it's getting plenty of light there. Right. Ah, okay. That's a good tip. That's how you can tell. Yep. Did you get that, Rohana? <laughs> Oh, yeah. I am following so well, you guys. I'm <laughs> basically professional right now. Thanks Good. for the She's playing solitaire on her phone. She <laughs> <doesn't know why. laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm lost. So I'm catching words and, and, like, phrases that I understand. I knew a little yep. bit when it came to the, the green noise thing. Not a lot. Not nearly this much. But a little yeah. bit. So I'm following. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Okay, so now that we're done with that rabbit hole, um, <laughs> um, and there's so much more because I, I was impressed with like a plugin like Red Giant has and things like that. Yep. And, um, yep, and and that's what I used to use actually was was the Red Giant denoiser. Um, oh, expensive. My, it is, yeah. Red Giant stuff. It all works really, really well, but you pay a hefty price tag for all that stuff. Um, yeah, but my issue with that was um, I was running it through After Effects, and so like oh. Resolve is slow. After Effects is like you know you can you can set your watch to how fast those those frames will render, and it'll be like one frame an hour. So <laughs> it just takes decades to render through that. So that's when I found Resolve. I, I never went back. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to have it integrated, not just... Um, yep. Plug in. Especially on Adobe. I mean, Adobe itself is an archaic code, in my opinion. But um, <clears throat> Well, and, and, and my biggest issue with Adobe stuff these days is that they still do the deal where you have to jump from one program to another and then back and forth. Integrate mm-hmm. it. Integrate it the way Blackmagic has. Their, their formula is genius. You know, you can you can do your ingestion. You can do your editing. You can do your color grading. You can do your sound work if if that's your thing. Um, you can even do effects work, and then you output one file versus having to do generations of renders, and then you know take that into another program, render that out, bring it back into another program, re-render that. Uh, losing a little bit of quality each time. Um, right. It's it's just so much easier. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> it before I really got into Resolve, I I'm more on the Final Cut side because. Um, yep. I'm sorry, Adobe. I just I don't like Premiere, but um, I understand why it's necessary because it's it's more consistent in that in its own way. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's just, uh, eh. and oh, Final Cut is not. <laughs> Whenever right. they do an update, it's like, oh, well, something changed here. So, <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, so I understand why both are good for certain reasons. But I did have to go between Resolve and Final Cut for like Electric Addiction for like, because obviously Resolve had um, color grading that was much better. So, yep. Um, but back to cameras. <laughs> uh, do you tend to stick with certain camera brands or? Um, I do not out of brand loyalty as much as um, what makes sense both financially and for the films that I tend to do, um, whether I'm hired to do the work or whether it's one of my own. Um, <clears throat> I, I tend to use Blackmagic cameras a lot uh, because they're, the Blackmagic RAW is just incredible uh, what you can do with that. Um, and, and the cameras have come a long way since the first Blackmagic cinema camera. So uh, they really are a, a, a powerhouse now and, and they're a contender any which way you look at it. Um, I also use Canon a lot. Um, I still have a, a Canon 1DC uh, from the Cinema EOS line, which is one of their very first cameras that they released in that line. 
uh, and I use it all the time, all the time. I absolutely love the image it produces. It's a fantastic mm. little camera. It looks like a DSLR because basically it's a souped up 1DX, but um, it's it's a phenomenal little camera. Um, and then I do use um, a Sony uh, A6400 once in a while, particularly if I'm using like a um, slider and I need the autofocus on it because it's, mm-hmm. you know, much easier than trying to pull focus, you know, even yeah, for... Yeah, Sony's a, are phenomenally great AC. at autofocus. Yes, they are. They, they just crush it. Um, other than that, I don't tend to like Sony images that much. I think they're too <laughs> noisy. Um, and, in fact, I, I was doing some test shots a few years back, and the film that was going to be shot was going to be heavily green screened. And the director and producer were set on using uh, the FS7. And right. it had just come out. It was the big camera. You know, everybody was psyched on it. And we did the tests and the green screen. It was so noisy. It was just terrible. And I was like, hmm. y- you don't want to use this. You know, it, it's, it's going to be a nightmare to key out and, and to not have it look all shitty. And ultimately, we ended up going with the uh, Blackmagic production camera, the, f- the first 4K one they put out, hmm. um, which was phenomenal. But you had to light that thing more than I think you would have to light film. It was ridiculous. It just <laughs> ate light for breakfast. Um, but the image was fantastic. I mean, it, you know, it had the it had the quality that you just kind of drool over. But you had to really heavily light it. Uh, Interesting. But I'm not I'm not really a fanboy of of any particular brand. I I dig what Blackmagic is doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, Red, their cameras are fantastic when they work. Um, <laughs> that's that's really their only biggest flaw is that their their software is always in a beta state. They they don't ever put out a stable kit you know and that's Mm. a problem um but the image quality that you get off those is phenomenal like i'm not ever gonna argue that they those there's a reason why hollywood loves that camera um and um you know there's there's some other ones out there i mean you know panasonic um i i think that they have potential i think that they too often hold back and and they yeah. they really need to be bold and, and do something innovative to to get people back into Panasonics because back when the P2 came out way back in the day when I was in film school that was like the camera to have everybody wanted that camera huh. you know it shot on memory cards people were blown away by that right. um, you know now Panasonic is sort of you know, you, you've got their DSLR lineup, and those cameras are fine um, in terms of, you know, especially if you're starting out, they're great. Uh, but that micro four thirds is going to get you with the light issues. You know, you're going to have to <laughs> heavily light it or it's going to look like crap. Their noise structure is terrible. So <laughs> you've really got to deal with some issues there in post. Um, and. Um, you know they're just they're just kind of funny little cameras. Uh, <laughs> they they do have potential though. I've seen some stuff shot on them that looks really great. But yeah. you know, I've seen some stuff shot on them that I'm like, oh no, I know that's <laughs> <laughs> like uh, the EVA one. Um, I was intrigued by it. Yep, at first. <laughs> But seeing, like, I don't know, just the way it, their color worked with it was just, I don't know. It yep. wasn't all there. Um, right. And, and, the and final... that's where, you know, I think that Canon's color science, when it comes in terms of people, like if you're filming human beings, you can't beat their color science. It looks just great. People look beautiful on, on Canon cameras. Um Blackmagic's color science has come a really long way 
and and it's starting to get there to the point where you know humans are looking far better than they did you know back in the day uh-huh. um, but you know yeah Panasonic and Sony uh, people look green you know they, they have this like well, cast to their skin tones that just oh no and then you gotta do right. that and post and that's a headache yeah I, I did notice that for a long time with Sony um, definitely yep. noticed the greens um but their latest version with like the the their release of the what A seven S three um mm-hmm. actually looks a lot better, I've noticed. Does it? Um in my opinion. Uh right on. from from what I've seen at least with what they've updated in their color science, it looks like they've made a leap forward on that edge. Nice. Um so that's something to look forward to perhaps. Yeah. Um also with Panasonic, I love their V-Log among the log formats. Mm-hmm. Um, the full V-Log, but um, I, I don't understand why they would just... Like you said, they're not being bold. They're just like holding back their quality to certain yep. um, cameras. Um, yep. So what is it? Like the S1 and the S1H? And then, like of course, the Vericam at the very top of their list has yep. like full log or whatever the hell it is <laughs> but uh yeah for for like uh smaller like the micro four thirds camera which i've ran on i <laughs> i still have a gh4 so i still use that today <laughs> with vlog only so <laughs> right on. but uh but it's you know i i remember when we shot a film it was um you shot with uh what was it canon c300 yep yeah the very was first that, one yeah that was c log right yep okay i tell the tell us the difference between like log and raw what's what's the deal here log is a compressed format uh but it's it's just you're getting more latitude in the highlights and in the shadows so Basically, the camera is seeing more color space, seeing more range from the brightest brights to the darkest darks. Raw, the camera is just literally taking everything that's coming into the sensor and putting that in one giant file. And you can do with that what you will later on in post. So it will take all of the color, all of the light information, all of the, you know, whether it's your ISO, your aperture, all that stuff, it's all being recorded onto that file. And you can't change your aperture, but it, the information's there in the metadata if you've got the right camera that you can plug all that into. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can change your ISO. You can, you can change your color balance. So if you were shooting and it was a nice sunny day and, and then all of a sudden the clouds rolled in halfway through your shot and it was a perfect take for the actors and, and you know everything else about camera and everything was perfect, well, then you can tweak it. And, and you can make that shot still look how it was intended to look. Um, you know, there's a lot more information there. And because it's not typically a compressed file, uh, Blackmagic RAW is a whole different animal there. But typically RAW is an uncompressed file. So they're just massive because there's just so much information there. Versus log file just means that it has more color information, but it's it's not keeping, like you can't, change the white balance and have it look perfect still. If you change the white balance, you'll start having issues. You know, you can do it. And, and mm-hmm. there's certain logs that are better than others. Uh, C-Log, C-Log 2, um, you know, Canon stuff is is really, really great. You can push it pretty far in post and color grading before it starts to fall apart. And mm-hmm. I've shot stuff specifically for trying to see how far can I push this before it falls apart. Hmm. Um, if it's on a DSLR, you can't push it very far. Even if it's log, you just can't because it's compressing that file so much. It's losing so much information that, you know, if, if you're grading on DaVinci, for example, once you get past five or six nodes of, of changes, you really start having issues with the image because it's just, it's not designed for that. If, if you hmm. want an image that... <clears throat> 
is really designed to be worked on in post and, and you can push it any which way you want. You can do whatever the hell you want with that image and it will still look good provided you're doing something that's intended to look good. Um, then you got to shoot raw. You just have to. Hmm. And, and, and on, on the flip side of that coin, if, if you have a fast turnaround and you're not going to be doing a lot of post color grading, if any, um, shoot log. Just, mm-hmm. just shoot log. It doesn't matter because it's it's great. You can you can do quite a bit with that, um, or you know you can even dial in your color in camera if you're bold enough and uh, <laughs> bake you know, it confident in. <laughs> in your work. You know, yeah, you just <laughs> bake that shit right in and, and you know edit it and output and you're you're done. You know, yeah. I've I've had to do it on some projects where it's like you know especially back in the day when i was doing like real estate videos um you know Mm. when do you need this well i need it tomorrow okay there's no time in post then you know you shoot the video you come home you edit it quick you throw on whatever you know music you're gonna do and then you send it out the door hmm interesting that's uh like hmm when it comes to some, something like Black Magic, it, they have like a a film version. Is that their version of log? Would you say or? Yes. Yeah, Black Magic. Um, they they kind of tend to do everything just a little bit different. Those Aussies. I don't know what their deal <laughs> is. I love them to death, but yeah, they 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 word things a little bit differently now and then. And uh, but yeah, their their film mode is is equivalent to log. Um, okay. And uh, it, it looks great. It looks great. I, I can't complain. Um, you know, but with, with Black Magic Raw, which is a compressed raw format, it's, it's, they kind of, I think they kind of took what Red was doing with their different compression levels of their raw, and they ran mm. with that. And they came up with something that just is mind blowing. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a compressed raw. It's still raw. You can do a lot with those images, um, but it's the the file sizes are so much smaller that you know it just doesn't make sense to not shoot in raw. If, if you're shooting on one of those cameras, just shoot in raw. As long as your computer can handle it in post, you know. If that's that's sort of the kicker, there is there's a lot of you know people, especially in the indie film world, they're running cameras that are five, six years old, they might not be able to handle that, you know, mm. especially at the higher resolutions. If you're, if you're shooting, you know, 12K raw on a black magic and you try and throw it on a five, six year old computer, it's not going to work. <laughs> it's just <laughs> the, the proxy, the that. power isn't yeah. there, you know? Yeah. Um, what, what power? No. <laughs> What kind of power do you need? <laughs> you need a lot of power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the kind that matches the price point of the camera with the computer. So. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> which is like whenever Apple releases their new Pro line, probably, whatever that is. So, Right. Um, I mean, you know, if, if you've got a fully loaded Mac Pro right now, it can handle it can handle 12K raw, no problem. It'll really? play it back natively without issue. But you're talking about a $55,000 computer. It better be able to do that. <laughs> you know. 55000 damn. Right. You can get a nice, nice vehicle for that price. Yeah, I know. Is this? <laughs> does it make coffee, too? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it charges your phone. Damn. <laughs> um damn yeah it's, it's gonna take you places <laughs> it's got wheels now um yeah. it'll go into your apple car <laughs> <laughs> um uh you talked about sensor types a little bit um mm-hmm. so obviously we have like full frame different variations of that between red and black magic and Everyone yep. has different sizes, it seems. Um, and then, of course, Super 35, Micro Four Thirds. Am I missing yep. anything? Um, I mean, you know, there's there's APS-C, which is not quite Super 35. There is APS-H, which is between Super 35 and full frame. Um, those are kind of the only other two that are really... 
you know, popular um, or being used. And those are pretty much exclusively to DSLRs. Um, for instance, the 1DC... Or mirrorless. When you're shooting that, it's, uh, it's APS-H in 4K. What? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that means. It gives you like a... a 197 to 1 aspect ratio or something. It's crazy. It's almost it always true. requires cropping in, in, in post. It doesn't matter which way you shoot it. <laughs> okay. So it's almost 2 to 1? Uh, it's almost, yeah. So it's kind of like uh, it's almost Academy, but it's not quite Yeah, like those Super 35s. Um, it really it really falls in the middle of of super 35 and and full frame and i mean you know i i, I love the image that that it produces um mm. it is a it is a nice image uh, have you ever shot on like an airy uh lf on a what airy lf oh um i have not no uh, i'd love to I know. <laughs> shoot on one of their large formats. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Uh, those things, you know, they look beautiful. And um, Aerie is sort of, you know, if if you look hard enough, you can find some Alexas on um, eBay and, and whatnot for sale for, for reasonable prices, uh, the older <laughs> ones. Um, oh, okay. But yeah. Versus, you know, reds tend to hold their values more for some reason, whereas the Aries, yeah. you know, they'll they'll plummet down once they're once the new ones come out. Um, it's like Canon, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But you know, even the older Aries, man, that that image is just gorgeous. You know, they they do it right, but they yeah. they take the time. You know, they take the time to develop it and you know, test the hell out of it. And then they go still not good enough. We got to spend another year on this. Those drones. And, you know, then when they come out with a camera, there's a reason why everybody's drooling over it. Cause mm -hmm. it's not like red where they're going to announce a camera. And then, you know, two years later, they're like, you know what? We scrapped that. Yeah. We forgot to tell you guys. Sorry. About that. <laughs> we have eight new cameras for you now. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> And they all have, like, these unique names, and it's just kind of like, huh. Yep. <laughs> you, I mean, like, you know, don't get me wrong. I, I dig what, what Jim Gennard is doing over there at Red. He's, he's you know, he's a trailblazer for sure. But, mm. you know, don't announce a camera unless you're going to come out with it. Don't, don't get the fanboys <laughs> hyped up and, and, and drooling and then just keep kicking them. You know, yeah, you can't do that. That ain't right. Yeah, I mean, at least Sony, you know, they have a line of continuation, and yep. they actually deliver on a lot of their things. Yep. As opposed to like, hmm. I, well, I, I guess when it comes to sensors, like Blackmagic doesn't have a full frame right now. No, they don't. No, nope. Super Thirty Five is the way they do it. So they're which is a, a, a bummer. I, I yeah. really wish they'd come out with a full frame. I would buy that in a New York minute. <laughs> I, I feel like, do you feel like it's coming? Is it just not here because of like things that happened or are they still working on that? I mean, like Panasonic has one, Sony has theirs, obviously. Um, even, at, you know, Grant who runs black magic, he has said many, many times they really pay attention to what, people are telling them and, and right. I think the loudest voices are saying super 35 is, is great. It, it works with our lenses. We don't have to buy new lenses and um, you know, it, it looks beautiful and it works for both film and commercial work and documentary work. So um, I think that's why they've stuck with it. Um, and, and the, Unfortunately, the filmmakers, the big ones, that would have the clout to influence Blackmagic to say, hey, we would like you to do a full-frame camera, they're the ones that are still 
shooting on film. So they don't care. They don't, you know, you're never going to get Chris Nolan to go, hey, Black Magic, you should put out a full frame camera. He doesn't know. He's going to shoot full frame on his actual 35 millimeter camera. That's what he does. You know, yeah. or, well, now he just does IMAX because why the hell wouldn't you? But, you know, yeah. those are the kind of, of level of filmmakers that would be able to make that happen. Um, the, the indie world, full frame lenses are more expensive. So, right. you know, most people don't tend to go that route. Um, and Super yeah. 35 does look pretty good. I mean, you can't fault it. So, Right. I I have yet to shoot personally on Super 35. I've had, like, obviously other cinematographers that I've worked with that do use that. Mm-hmm. But um, I... <laughs> Uh, personally, have not owned a Super Thirty Five yet, but uh, one day, one day, <laughs> or maybe I'll just do like Panasonic, just jump into full frame, be- <laughs> 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 you know, just like ah, Super Thirty Five. We'll go full frame. Wait a minute, <laughs> aren't you going to update one of these? You know, right? But I understand the reasoning for it because one, like a battery life, is one of the big things Panasonic has going for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just their power management is really good. Um, it is, it is. That is, that is an area where black magic fails huge. Oh God. Yes. Jeez. It's like their cameras just eat batteries for breakfast. It's, it's insane. Right. And then you have like Canon entering the mirrorless game and it's like cameras melting in your hand and it's just like <laughs> what are we doing here it's like you have a camera that has everything you wanted except it, it, it explodes when you're done with it so right <laughs> which is um, you know that's a terrifying thing yeah you know? I mean if, if I was if I was shooting and all of a sudden my camera caught on fire or burst into flames in front of me I would never go back to that brand again that would take away any brand loyalty I had because to (laughs) me that means somewhere along your QC process you failed on an epic fucking scale and there's on these big camera companies there's no excuse for that just none you've got the money and you've got the time do it right there's no excuse these days. You know, if you're if you're some Kickstarter, Indiegogo, you know, first time camera company and you put out a camera and, and you know, twenty percent of your units catch fire, well you learn. But if you've been around for sixty, seventy years, there's no excuse for that. No. Forget it. Do your job. <laughs> Yes, especially with the, with what these cameras cost. You know, you, even exactly. though it's a DSLR, they're not cheap. It's not like well, somebody walked in and bought a disposable camera for five bucks. You know, they're plunking down, you know, fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred bucks for one of those cameras, and then it catches fire. No thanks. Right. Plus, you have like, um, gosh, what is it? The uh, all these cameras that are at the either DSLR or mirrorless cameras these days, um, like even with like the 4K specs, now that 4K is kind of officially here in the camera world. Um, yeah. Like what they start at like three thousand. It's just like this is like the lowest level in full frame, maybe, but they're still going to be like two, three thousand dollars. So it's just kind of like, this isn't cheap. So, right. Right. And and you're seeing more and more, um, indie filmmakers turning to, you know, making, um, making films on their phones, which is, is totally fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's absolutely, especially nowadays it's doable. Um, Mm -hmm. and if you, invest in companies like uh, Beast Grip or Moment where they've put out cinema lenses that you can actually use on your phone, um, you can get some incredibly beautiful images. 
uh, yeah. and, and you can really make something. Um, but, you know, if you're looking for something that has a full frame sensor and, and you want that look, yeah. Uh, if you're, if you can't afford, you know, a, a $2,500, $3,000 camera minimum, um, rent it, you know, that's, that's your best option. Right. You know, save up for the project, rent the camera, uh, and see, because some people, you know, <clears throat> some people really want to shoot full frame and then they shoot it and they can't handle the critical focus. They can't handle that depth of field. Um, mm. And they go, you know what, I'll go back to Super 35 or Micro Four Thirds. That was a lot easier to handle. Mm. Because when if you're shooting on like a an 85 mil wide open at, you know, T1.4 or 1.5 or even 2.8 on a full frame, you're talking about hairs that are going to be in focus, like an individual hair on somebody's face. And everything past that can be out of focus and everything in front of that can be out of focus. So but obtaining critical focus is really a challenge. Right. Um, but, you know, whereas if you're on a micro four thirds, even if you're on an 85 and it's wide open, pretty much that whole face is in focus because there's just there's not the information there you know the sensor's too small it just doesn't allow it hmm so shallower depths of field people when you're looking at larger sensors <laughs> yep uh so yeah we touched on lenses here let's go through that there are mounts there are lenses there are types of lenses there are filters <laughs> there are polarizers or NDs let's let's uh <laughs> let's talk about the mess that are lenses right now every <laughs> proprietary mount is now every new camera it seems has its own mount yeah um thank god for things like well in a way thank god for metabones and viltrox yep. and all the adapters but yep there's something lost in adapters too. So, uh, where do we start here, Brent? I think, I think, you know, most people when they're starting out, they're, they're going to be looking at EF lenses and EF mounts or, you know, Canon's new mounts. Um, the RF. They have adapters for the, yeah, the R's for, for the EF as well. Um, because there's way more EF mount lenses than anything else out there. I mean, it mm -hmm. just is. Um, and you can go to any camera shop and you can buy old EF lenses for cheap. You can buy off-brand EF lenses for ridiculously cheap. Or you can get the old Canon FD mount lenses and then get an adapter for EF and go that route. And uh, you can get those for like 10 bucks. And the image quality is phenomenal. Hmm. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, if, if you're getting more serious about filmmaking... Um, then you're looking at more expensive lenses. You're looking at lenses that have the PL mount, um, which you know was developed by Panavision, and it's the positive lock, um, which is very robust. Um, I know yeah. Canon did come out with an EF mount um, that had a locking mechanism on it briefly. Um, and in fact, one of my Metabones adapters has that, and uh, it's Sorry, basically EFS. a PL mount lens. You know, um, no, no, it wasn't the EFS. EFS oh. is is the difference between uh, the full frame and, and the uh, APS-C size. APS-C. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, no, it was like called like Cine Lock or something like that. Oh, uh, okay. Hmm. And uh, it was basically an EF mount, and then it had a twist, uh, twist you know, <laughs> PL mount lock on it. Yeah. And um, you know, it was it was a little more robust, a little hardier, because the EF mount is a very fragile mount. If you put too much strain on it, it will break uh, fairly easily. Um, but uh, you know, any any high end cinema lens is going to be PL mount. It, it's it's the way they do it. Uh, because any high-end cinema camera is going to be a PL mount camera. 
And, um, you know, I think that most people starting out are, are going to be shooting on stills lenses that are being used as, uh, you know, film or video, whichever you want to call it, mm-hmm. um, which is fine. I mean, it's, it's, you know, there's some stills lenses out there that produce absolutely stunning imagery. Um, and especially if you're just starting out, um, you know, get yourself a, a an old, you know, GH4 or, or a GH5 or, a, you know, ADD or whatever the hell they're on now for those, for Canon, um, or even a, a Pocket 4K, you know, drop 1200 bucks and, and get yourself one of those and, um, you know, test out some stills lenses, you know, get a feel for it. And then when you move on to proper cinema lenses, you'll not only understand what the hype is, but you'll appreciate it so much more. Yeah. Talk about the the, difference there. Like what, what makes a cinema lens versus like uh, a stills lens? Build quality is a huge factor. Uh, Cinema lenses are built like tanks. They're, they're built to withstand anything you can throw at them. Um, The glass quality is substantially better. Um, The coatings that they use on the lenses, absolutely superior. And then you're talking about, you know, your mount is always going to be much, much more robust, uh, particularly if it's a PL mount versus any stills camera mount lens. It's, it's, there's no, there's no competition there at all. Um, And, and finally your, your barrel rotation and the smoothness of pulling focus, you're going to have hard stops versus most stills lenses, modern ones, just the ring just spins infinitely. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you're going to have manual aperture. Um, there's, you're not going to find a cinema lens that has, you know, no way to control that aperture or a hard click ring they just don't make them that way because sometimes you need to change your aperture mid shot and you need to do it nice and smooth. Uh, hmm. especially if you're going from a, an exterior to an interior or vice versa. Um, right. you know, hmm. you've, you've got to be able to do that. And, and so, you know, I used to, when I first started out, I had a bunch of old Canon FD lenses, um, and then an EF mount converter. And I thought, well, I'll never need to get any other lenses. <laughs> and and the old FD mount lenses had hard stops. You know, they, they did for pulling focus, which was great. Right. Um, and for some of them, um, they actually used the same glass that they used on the old Canon 35 cinema lenses. Um, they just put it in a stills lens. And so those lenses were used to shoot films like Star Wars A New Hope, Alien, Blade Runner. You know, films that defined a generation of filmmakers today. Um, and, and films that are considered classics. Um, and so you, you can get lenses that are stills lenses that are phenomenal. But when I got my first cinema lens, I just, I beyond fell in love. That's not even the right term for it. I was just totally enamored and, and fascinated by it. And I could only afford one at the time, so I would shoot everything on you know one focal point. And <laughs> every time you know a, a director or, or you know the scene would force me to use something else, I would just bitch and moan because <laughs> it hmm. wasn't my cinema lens. Um, <laughs> now I've I've come along to a point where you know I've got um, a full kit of the. Um, SLR Magic? No. Well, I've got the SLR Magic Anamorphotes, um, mm. the actual anamorphic ones. I've got a full kit of those, and then um, what are the other ones that I have a full kit of that are not the anamorphics? Uh, the Zines. I have a full kit of Really? Those. You have Zines? Um, yep. And, and um, I love shooting on them. They're beautiful. Um, razor sharp. And they better be. <laughs> yeah. And um, a pro tip out there for anybody who's uh, looking to get cinema lenses 
and not pay retail, but you don't want a used one. Uh, green Toe. Check out the Green Toe app. Um, mm -hmm. They let you submit offers to retailers for how much you're willing to pay for something. And then the retailer can accept or decline your offer. And so, as an example, the zines retail for, uh, well, when I got them, they retailed for $2,500 a piece. I don't know if that's changed or not, but um, I think the most I paid for one was $2,000. And for three of them, I paid $1,000. Um, and then the other ones, I paid, you know, anywhere in between $1,000 and, and $2,000. Um, wow. But I saved myself thousands and thousands of dollars that way uh, right it was just ridiculous um huh. because you know don't pay retail unless you have to there's there's ways to get around <laughs> that and they're they're not gray market versions they're not international versions they are the fully warranted u.s version of the lens um they're just you're just negotiating basically with um you know the retailers that you know, like they, I, I, I talked to one guy after the fact and he said, you know, um, they get the lenses for like 1200 bucks a piece and then they sell them for the MSRP of 2500 There's a lot of wiggle room there. There's a lot of negotiating room. And if the mm -hmm. lens has been sitting on their shelf for long enough, they just want to get it out so that they can at least recoup some of the money they put into it. They'll go lower. They'll go lower than what they even paid for it. And so green toe, it's, it's, Phenomenal! I've used it for so many things, uh, electronics-wise, um, you know, cameras, TV, you name it. I, I, I sing their praises any chance I get. Phenomenal company. Good to know. Yep. So there you go, indie filmmakers. Some uh, ways to get fast glass, perhaps, that isn't as expensive as retail. Yep. Uh, I know Rahana is going to look at that up right away. <laughs> I'm already, I'm already there. I don't yeah. know what you mean. I'm going to. <laughs> yeah, I think she is ready for prime lenses. Right. One hundred percent. It's prime time for Rahana. Um, <laughs> and then, lastly, like all the uh, other, we kind of touched on like ISO. You you stick to native. Why is that important? And then, like shutter, what? What, what type of shutter angle or speed do you use? Um, um, I tend to, well, for the ISO, yeah, I, I, I shoot whatever the camera native ISO is. Um, mm. <clears throat> and that's just important because that's, you know, when the manufacturer of that sensor did their testing, they found that, you know, if it's a single ISO sensor, that that particular ISO was the cleanest in the signal-to-noise ratio so that you got the best looking image. Or if it's a dual sensor, then you've got two different ISO levels where essentially you hit a certain point and then it resets that signal to noise ratio. And so you stick to those, you'll have a nice clean image every single time. That doesn't mean that there won't be noise there because if you under light in your shadows, there'll still be noise even, even at the native ISO of the camera. Yeah, um, that's just the nature of digital. Um, but you know, lighting is is key. I, I I think that too many indie filmmakers don't, especially if they call themselves a cinematographer, they don't understand the art of controlling light. Controlling light is what makes a great image great, and. Mm. You know, I've I've shot outside in the middle of the night and there was no way to get power there. The budget didn't allow for a Jenny, so we had to figure out, well, how can we light this scene where these kids are standing outside of a van on the side of the road that's broken down? Well, we found the only street light on this old country road for miles and miles and miles. It just happened to be one street light. Um, <laughs> and we parked the van in such a way that that light was hitting that van. And then we also manipulated other vehicles outside of the shot to add light where I needed it with their headlights. And, um, 
Then we used some portable lights that run off batteries as well, and we were able to light the scene to a point where there was no noise, and it looked great. It was nice and clean. Um, so there's always ways to do it. Um, these people that show up and, and they've got their camera and they've got a $5 reflector that they bought at Walmart, no lights whatsoever, and they say, uh, yeah, no, it'll look great. No, it won't. It won't look great. And you don't know what you're doing. You need to learn. You need to do some more research. You need to read um, and, and learn about what lighting does and, and how it affects your sensor and your lenses and controlling that light, controlling your ISO and, and what all of that does when you put it together in harmony to make an image either good or bad. And too many, you know, the, the biggest, biggest piece of advice I could give any budding cinematographer is get a subscription to American Cinematographer and then actually read through cover to cover every <laughs> issue. You will learn so much, it'll blow your mind. And and it will make you an infinitely better shooter. Just is right out of the gate. Is that on the Apple Newsstand now? Do they have that? or? Um, I don't talking? know if it's on Apple Newsstand or not. I've, I've had a direct subscription with JSC <laughs> for years now. I, I, I don't right. really know, but... Um, I love it's, that. It's magazine. not expensive. It's like twenty bucks a year. It's, it's yeah. super cheap for the digital version. And oh, there's a digital um, version. Nice. Yeah, and and once you subscribe to the digital version, you actually have access to all the digital archives going back years and years and years. Damn. So you can learn stuff about your favorite films that were shot, you know, decades ago, and um, you'll learn tricks. And, and especially if you're, you know, I had this shoot where the producer and director decided the look they wanted was a combination of The Empire Strikes Back and Blade Runner. Now, <laughs> those are two, while they're both sci-fi, they're two very different looking films. And so what did I do? Well, I dug through the archives and I found how they shot The Empire Strikes Back, the, the lenses they used, the cameras they used, the lights that they used, everything. And then I dug through and I found the Blade Runner stuff. Hmm. And I went through and I took aspects of both and combined it. And when we shot the first scene, um, I went home that night and it was like one in the morning when I got home from set. And I, but I was so amped up. I, I dumped the footage and I graded it right away and I rendered out just a single shot that we had done. And hmm. I sent it to the producer and the director and they called me up at like six in the morning. Because, it, you know, when they got the alert on their phone from me, you know, I texted them, of course, you know, mm -hmm. wake up, fuckers, you need to check this out. <laughs> and it was exactly what they wanted, you know. Huh. But the only way I would have been able to achieve that is if I had done the research. Okay, Brent, because what was that film? It. <laughs> uh, it was a film that unfortunately never um, <laughs> oh, was able damn. to be released due to copyright claim by Lucasfilm. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't How actually dare talk you match about our it, image. But, um, yeah, yeah. It was well. It, it was a uh, no. it was a Star Wars fan film that these guys were doing, and um, it basically got too much attention in the wrong way. And, oh, uh, it was unfortunate because uh, you know the producer had sunk a ton of money into this, and. Um, it was really coming out great. Everybody was really oh. stoked. And then they got the cease and desist, and it was like, oh, that's done. Damn. And then, you know, that happens. Not not so much anymore, but back when this was happening, and, you know, it was right. kind of during the high time of the Paramount lawsuit over the Star Trek fan film, and everybody was kind of holding their breath, and we just, mm. you know, we kind of ran with it with the film and threw caution to the wind and it ended up, you know, biting them in the ass. So, mm. never got released. Damn, but it looked got pretty. buried. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least someone saw it. Um, right. <laughs> uh, okay, so we've kind of wrapped our technical side with one last question and then we'll move into some of the questions that Ron has. 
Um, for a starting out, uh, someone who's just starting in maybe wanting to do camera work, where would you steer them for like a starter camera, a starter lens set? Like what? And, and I'm not talking thousands of dollars, maybe just a few hundred. Like what? Where where would you send them? What would they start with? Um, I would say go to like mechanic school and don't get into film. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's 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 so hard. Don't do it. But if you're dead set on it, um, I would say find an old uh, T2i maybe. Um, Oh, come on, T5i, come on. <laughs> Is that what they're up to now? They're up to, like, 7, so... Holy God. Yeah. Um, the Rebels are great. Yeah, I mean, you can you can get a, a, a used one of those for, you know, just a couple hundred bucks, 200 bucks tops. And um, it'll produce a nice image. It'll, it'll get your feet wet. Um, get an FD mount to EF mount converter for 10 bucks on Amazon and then go to your local camera shop and like once a year most camera shops have like a clearance sale where they'll, they'll just be like getting rid of you know all their inventory um, and they'll have all these old lenses for five to ten bucks a pop these old FD mount Canon lenses which are beautiful lenses they're way better built than today's lenses uh, in terms of you know standing up to the elements and and if you drop it it's not going to break into a million pieces and uh, and they have hard stops so you can really learn to pull focus um, you'll learn you know it, it's it's got an APS-C sensor which is almost super 35 so you're going to get a nice quality image out of that Canon batteries they last a long time so they do good um, and um, you know that that camera is going to produce an image that for starting out is great you're not going to you know you're not going to beat it unless you've got money you know to drop on something much more expensive all the way around right. but i'd say oh. get that and then the the big thing too would be don't shoot it handheld get a tripod with a proper video fluid head um, you know, Manfrotto makes nice ones. Um, well, I mean, there's a ton of manufacturers out there that make nice ones for just a couple hundred bucks. And, um, you know, because DSLRs, their sensors are kind of floating in there. And when you're hand holding them, they jiggle a lot. And you're going to get the jello effect and it's going to look like garbage. So <laughs> slap that thing on the tripod and get just some nice images and shoot constantly learn read everything you can you know <laughs> get not only american cinematographer but you know i've i've bought books um on ebay old cinematography books i'm talking going back to the 20s you know and there's all these things in there that they don't teach you in film school that modern cinematography books don't talk about hmm. uh, but you'll learn these little tricks and you're like that's how they did that and you can still apply it today. And, and you know, beyond that stuff, um, learn what color balance means. Learn that you really only need three different ones. You need 3200, 4400, and 5600 Kelvin. Beyond that, you're wasting your time. Because if you're shooting film, that's what you'd have to work with. You'd have your tungsten film, you'd have your fluorescent film stock, and you'd have your daylight film stock. And that's what those would be rated to. And once you learn that, and you apply that to your shooting, you'll understand why when you're shooting outside on a cloudy day, it looks a certain way when it's exposed properly and your white balance is properly set at 5600 versus if it's a nice sunny day. Once you master those, then you can start playing around with other, you know, color balances and, and expanding that, you know, playing around with different ones. Um, and even like shutter speed, um, you know, play with it. Learn what it does. You know, learn that if you're shooting and you're, you're doubling your frame rate with your shutter speed, it's going to look 
nice and, and smooth and dreamy versus if you crank that shutter speed up, you're going to have um, a different effect. If you slow it down, you're going to have a different effect. You know, mm -hmm. um, if you if you take that shutter speed and um, you know you you go to you know 90 degree shutter, it's going to look like Saving Private Ryan. You know, you're going to have this this staccato effect. Um, if you ramp it up super fast, you're going to have it look like Monday Night Football. <laughs> you know, everything's going to look hyper real. Yeah. Um, you know, these these things are, are very important to learn. They're very important to um, discover, you know. Uh, same, with, same with frame rates. Play with different frame rates if you have a camera that can do it or rent a camera and, and, and play with the frame rates. Learn, you know, what, what does under-cranking do? What does over-cranking do, you know? How do those affect the amount of light that's hitting the sensor? You know, how do those affect uh, your final image, you know? Because all of that stuff, they will, they will teach you in film school if you go to a proper film school, and, and you'll learn it all. But, you know, too many indie filmmakers these days aren't going to film school because they don't think they need to. And it's biting right. them in the ass because it's taking them ten times as long to learn these basic things that you really, really should know if you want to be a good <laughs> cinematographer. Right. And uh, for the record, um, it is a T8i is the current, or at least the most recent Rebel. T8. Oh, <laughs> I that shot. Makes me feel old. <laughs> I know. I think I shot Allure on like a T2i, yeah. <laughs> or at least my cinematographer did, and we had to borrow that because it was expensive. <laughs> right. Uh, and I think at that time T3i was out, but. We could only scrounge up a T2 eye, so <laughs> it's funny. It's like, right? yeah. And plus, I mean, it wasn't until 2018 that I ditched the GH1, so. <laughs> wow. But I, but I had to hack that film, or that camera, so right, in order to right. get, you know, the certain blacks a certain way, and uh, you, you learn with what you have, basically, so. Yeah. Another thing, you know, and, and we did this in film school, and it was massively, massively helpful. Take a scene from a film you like. Um, you like maybe the way it was shot, the way it was lit, the overall look of it, the, the directing, whatever. Take a scene from a film you like and recreate it. Hmm. You will learn so much from that. It, it's invaluable. Um, I love it, and I think I think we had to do one from um, Phantom of the Opera, from the the film adaptation of it, the Andrew Lloyd Webber film adaptation, and um, you know we we actually like built this like cage set and stuff, and, and we did this whole scene, and while we were doing it. You know, our, our professor was explaining, you know, okay, this is why we're doing this and this is why we're doing that. And we were all, you know, young and dumb and, and kind of just like, okay, I don't understand because this looks nothing like what it's, you know, looks like in the film. Of course, we're looking at it through our naked eye. And then when we put the camera on and we filmed it, and then we looked at it on the screen, we were just blown away. Because it was wildly different. And um, we learned so much from that that, you know, we, we started asking him, you know, every couple of weeks, hey, can we, can we do this scene? Can we, can we try this one? You know, because we wanted to, you know, wanted to create something that, you know, one of our heroes had created and, and go, wow, okay, that's how they did that. Because part of it demystifies it and part of it lets you understand that these people that make these films it is not one person you know there's the there's the cinematographer on any film but cinematographers on hollywood pictures they don't get that image on their own 
they get that image because they have a team of people working with them. And in, it's actually the reason why since COVID started and, and our country has been basically in lockdown, um, I haven't shot anything. I, I, I did one doc uh, in May of last year, and that was it. Hmm. Uh, because I need my crew. I, I Doing it all by myself, that's, it's too hard. It, it, I'm telling you flat out, if you want to do it right and, and you're trying to do it by yourself, you don't have enough time to do it by yourself if you're trying to do it properly in a bigger shoot. It's taxing, uh, yeah. Yeah. You, 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 it eats up so much time trying to, you know, do the lighting and, and the modifiers and, and then, you know, setting up the camera, setting up the, you know, sliders or, or you know, the, the rails or whatever you're, whatever you're shooting with. Um, you know, your jib, all that stuff, it takes so much time versus mm-hmm. if you can focus on the camera as the cinematographer and you can tell your team, okay, uh, you know, I need you guys to rig these lights. I need you guys to set up the, the crane over here. I need you to get the steady cam ready for when we're going to move to that. Well, then you've got five or six other people helping you get all that shit done. And that takes away a huge amount of time that it would require you to do all that by yourself. And yeah. it, it makes your job easier. You know, I, I've, I've gotten to the point now where, um, I am spoiled. I've worked with some really, really great gaffers and grips and man, I wouldn't trade them for anything. I, I wouldn't, I would never want to go back to the way I used to have to do it. <laughs> right. Cause it's just, when you work with a, a great crew, everything just, just flows you know and before you know it like instead of it taking four hours to set up it it took you 30 minutes and then you're ready to roll cool you know and you get to focus more on as a cinematographer you get to focus more on the image that you want to create versus all the little technical things that you have to worry about to create that image you you tell other people you know how you want things done, how you want a scene lit. And then you let them go and do that while you worry about, you know, the camera and working with the director, figuring out, you know, where are the actors going to be? What are they going to be doing? You know, the mood of the scene, all that stuff. You know, that stuff is so important. Let the people that are on your crew that are, are hopefully getting paid to do their job, do their job. So that you can focus on what's important, which is that final image. Mm -hmm. Brent, um, can you tell us when you mentioned that you haven't really worked or like shot anything um, for coming up on a year now um, because of pandemic and everything. But when you are in that moment, regardless of what you're shooting, um, having you know, been in, in the industry for a while and been doing this for so long, can you tell us what really inspires you the most, whether it's leading up to a project or even in the moment um, when you're you're really there and doing it? Um, honestly, it, it's, there's two things. The first is um, you see how hard the actors are working and you want to do them justice. You want to do something that when they look at their work that they have put countless hours into rehearsing, memorizing their lines, figuring out their character, figuring out the look of their character, everything that they have to do, um, you want them to be proud of that. You don't want them to look at it and go, oh, this looks like crap, you know? Um, Because... Mm-hmm. Even the best actor, if they are not shot well, it can still look like crap. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the other thing that really inspires me in the moment is light. I, I just we were we were shooting this comedy a few years ago, and uh, there was a scene in it. Um, as with all comedies, you know, there's there's drama because that's what spurs on the comedy. Mm-hmm. And so there was this sort of heavy scene and this girl was confessing her feelings to this guy that she likes. And they're sitting in this living room and it was golden hour. 
and the light, I moved the camera just slightly, and the light cascaded off her face and then flared off the lens in just such an absolutely beautiful way. And I, I stopped everything. I said, we got we to gotta reshoot this take, you know, from this angle. We got to do it right here, right now, because we're going to lose it in two minutes. It'll be gone. And, and we did. And it, it's in the finished film, and it looks beautiful. Um, because to me, as a, when I'm working as a cinematographer, there's nothing more beautiful than just, you know, the gods lining everything up and, and suddenly, you know, the image looks exactly how you could ever hope to wish it to be. What film was yeah. that? Mm -hmm. uh, that was FML. It has not been released yet. <laughs> Coming because, soon. Yeah. Because of a pandemic that happened. Yeah. That old thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what a what genre or if you have one what what genre is your favorite to uh to work on to shoot horror <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I like that's I, the most I common answer in minnesota <laughs> yeah they're they're just so fun um mm -hmm. i mean i love period pieces as well um I've, I've been fortunate enough to shoot some stuff some period stuff that um was a lot of fun uh, just because you're you're shooting it in a very different way that's not not modern, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, horror is just a blast. It's it's fun for the cast, it's fun for the crew, and um, there's there's just something about it that, despite all the blood and guts and screaming, you just have a good time. You know? <laughs> Versus yeah. if it's something like a drama or. Um, you know, something that that's even a comedy. They're they're all lit so differently. You know, horror for the most part has a very specific style of lighting, and um, it's very you know very harsh lighting typically. Um, but it's a lot more creating shafts of light. Um, Sci-fi is similar in that, but it's a very different aesthetic overall. But yeah, horror is is just a blast to shoot. And then um, I have one final question, and then we won't hold mm -hmm. you ransom for any longer. Uh, <laughs> what would you like people to, whether it's, um, you know, after just meeting you and listening to you here or working with you, um, like, what do you want people to really remember you by? Oh, shit. That's a <laughs> I should have told you I was going to ask that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> that was the big um, one. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I, my favorite time in a theater was I hadn't been doing this very long, just maybe four years, and I did a 48-hour film, and we got it turned in like an hour late, so it didn't qualify. Um, and we were the only one for that that day that was late for that showing. So our film played first. And there was a opening scene and it was like a dramatic thriller and um, something happens in the, in the scene and, and the audience gasped and it felt phenomenal. <laughs> I loved it. It was just this amazing connection this this moment of realization that every single one of them had connected so deeply with what was going on in that scene and the way it was shot and, and edited and directed that they audibly gasped and um, they, that meant that they were enthralled in the story you know and and mm -hmm. so I guess if there's something that I want people to remember me for um, it's that um, whatever they watched when they watched that that film that I did um, that they connected with it on on something more than just a you know like there's so many films that you can watch or, or TV shows that you can just kind of have them on in the background because mm -hmm. they, they don't pull you in uh, versus I like to do things um, that really suck people in and get them mm -hmm. involved um, you know Alan's film Mary was a prime example of that that film, that's a powerful film. 
and people when when we had the cast and crew screening people were you know they, they had tears in their eyes and and you could tell they were just really really powerfully you know affected by that film and um I, I to this day, Alan, I think it's one of your best films because mm-hmm. it, it's such a deep story, and um, it, it connects to people on a on a level that I think a lot of films don't. You know, in general, mm-hmm. not not your films, just in general in films that don't you know don't connect with people. So I would like people to remember me for the way I made them feel when they were sitting in that theater. Yeah. That sounds phenomenal. Also, real well, quick, what was that film? Um, oh. <laughs> For that 48. Man, I, <laughs> now i got to go through the archives here. Um, Your question's harder than mine, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. <laughs> um, man. <laughs> I, I can't That's remember. okay. That's okay. It it's was a 48, 48 It was a 48 years ago. that happened like <laughs> 13, 14 years ago. I, yeah. I, the black hole I sucked it remember. in, didn't it? That last year it just... Did. <laughs> there, yep. it, it was the I, other I tell day. you, man. Yeah, there, there are films that people will talk to me about that I, I worked on with them, and I've completely forgotten the film because... I've, I've just worked on so many at this point, and I, I don't. I hope that doesn't make me sound like a pompous ass. It's just that <laughs> it's kind of the nature of the business. Like while mm-hmm. you're working on that film, it's the most important thing in your life. You know, yeah. it's 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 all consuming. But the moment you're done with it, you're like, okay, on to the next one. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. very, you know, it, it's even like the nature of relationships in this business. You know, you you make friends on set. People become almost like family. And then once that shoot wraps, you might not see or talk to those people for two, three years, you know, even though you mm-hmm. love them, you just, it's the nature of the business. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah I, I wish I could remember the name of that film, but I just, I can't. Well, at least you remembered Mary, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that just means that resonated with him, which is the point. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Well, Brent, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day and chatting with us. We really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. This was yeah, really was interesting. Awesome. I know I learned a lot. Hopefully our listeners did too. Um, and until next time, everyone, uh, thanks for catching up in Selma, Minnesota. <laughs>